I hope you have your Bibles. If you do, please turn to Matthew 6, 25 to 34. As we look at what Jesus says, this is called the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, and it was quite an extensive sermon where he covered many, many important topics, and worry or anxiety is one of them, and he talks about how to deal with that. Uh, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Many years ago, psychologist Rollo May called anxiety one of the most urgent problems of our day. I don't think things have improved, do you? I think they've gotten worse. Christian counselor Dr. Gary Collins explained the real cause of anxiety. He wrote, Anxiety or worry comes because of a sinful turning from God. Instead of acknowledging His sovereignty and preeminence, we have shifted the burdens of life onto ourselves and assume that we alone can handle the problems that we face. When man turns from God and becomes his own God, increased anxiety is inevitable. Perhaps it's not surprising then that in an age of increased godlessness, there is also increased anxiety. I think he put his finger right on it. The problem isn't that we're being bombarded with new and more worrisome things. The problem is we are less focused on God than we've ever been. Physicians suggest some of the possible effects of excessive worry or anxiety, such as headaches, skin rashes, muscle tension, stomach discomfort, shortness of breath, sleeplessness, fatigue, and loss of appetite. And now if these symptoms are just temporary, they don't cause as much harm, but if they persist over a long time, our health can suffer. Some of the psychological reactions are acute ang- uh, are loss of memory, loss of productivity and creativity. It can hinder one's capacity to relate to other people normally. And if it goes on, it can lead to drug and alcohol abuse, severe depression. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, 40 million American adults, that's roughly 18% of the population, have an anxiety disorder. That's a new statistic, by the way. The American Psychiatric Association found that 39% of the people they recently surveyed reported being more anxious now than they were at this time last year. And I'm sure you've probably heard reports like that yourself on the television. So our culture is filled with anxious people. A small percentage suffer anxieties caused by some kind of trauma that they've endured. But many people are filled with worry about things that they can't control. And what is astounding is that many Christians are also filled with worry and anxiety even about the most mundane things of life. Look at the previous subject that Jesus addresses in Matthew 6. If you go back to verse 19, he says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where they neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you're focused all of your attention on trying to gather those material things that you need, and that's all you think about, then you're going to worry about those things all the time. And so you can imagine the disciples thinking to themselves, well, Lord, uh, we do have to worry about getting those things. I mean, we do have to put food on the table. We have to worry about where we're going to sleep. And so the disciples might have thought that Jesus was underplaying the need to provide food and clothing for themselves, which in their culture was not an easy thing to do. But we also worry about those things, and it's a lot easier for us to take care of those needs. What Jesus gets at here in this passage is that God's redeemed children should not be consumed with anxiety over the things of this life, because God God loves us and he promises to provide what we really need. Now let's look at the passage and read through it. Starting with Matthew 6, verse 25, he says, Therefore, based upon what he just told them, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? 
And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither tin, to, uh, toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And remember here, he's talking to his disciples. They're the target audience here. Therefore, do not be anxious of saying, well, what should we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after the, all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what does Jesus say? He repeats himself three times in verse 25, in verse 31, verse 34. He says, stop worrying. That's a literal translation. He doesn't say, don't let yourself get worried about things or don't become anxious. He says, stop doing that. Stop worrying. And it's not a suggestion. It's in the form of a command. Now, what is worry or anxiety? Uh, the dictionary describes it as mental distress or having a distracting concern for something, especially some impending event or trouble. And Jesus says, like in verse 25, he says, don't worry about your needs. He says the same thing in verse 31. I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Don't be anxious about that. Verse 31, he says, stop being anxious. Stop being anxious about all of those things like what do we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear. Most of us have been anxious at one time or another about being able to provide the necessities of life, like food or clothing, whether or not we'll have a job tomorrow, or uh, whether or not we'll be able to obtain those things that are necessary to take care of our family. So it's a common human occurrence, isn't it? Whatever it is in life that we need, we can find a way to worry about it. Some of us, like myself, wake up in the middle of the night at 2 or 3 in the morning and worry about it, which is bad for your sleep clock, or whatever they call that. Now I'm going to tell you a remedy for that later on. So Jesus gives us a remedy in here, too. Jesus says, stop fretting about those things. He's not saying, by the way, that we shouldn't work to provide these things for ourselves. He's not saying that we shouldn't go out and work and earn a living so that we can put food on the table. The Bible tells us to work to provide the necessities of life, but Jesus says don't worry about them. A believer ought to have confidence in God's love and his desire and power to provide us with the necessities of life. He says in verse 34, don't worry about the future. That's something a lot of people are worrying about right now, right? Will I survive this virus? Will our country survive the crisis that it's in right now? I mean, we can make up all kinds of things to worry about. Look at verse 34. He says, do not be anxious about tomorrow because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. <laughs> Don't waste your time about things you have no control over. There's enough trouble today to worry about. It's amazing how preoccupied we can get about what might happen tomorrow. Now, you don't need to raise your hand, but how often have you been wrong in predicting what might, be, what might happen in the future in your life? Like most of the time? Again, Jesus is not saying we shouldn't plan for the future or provide for the future when it's in our means to do so. As a matter of fact, Scripture says you're irresponsible if you don't do that. But we cannot control the future. We plan and provide sensibly based upon what we've seen happen in the past. We try to plan for the future so that others don't have to take care of us. But he says, don't waste today worrying about tomorrow. Otherwise, you'll never enjoy life. 
When Jesus says, we have enough trouble today to take care of, don't worry about the things that you don't have any control over. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of the time we worry about things we have no control over, right? And we will readily admit to ourselves, man, it's such a waste of energy and emotional energy and time. Now, here's some reasons that Jesus gives that we believers should not worry. And he's addressing this to people who are his disciples. He says in verse 25, our physical needs are only a small part of life. So so don't be preoccupied with those things. Don't be anxious about your life, verse 25, what you're going to eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? We're not just physical beings is what he means here. And this physical world is not all there is to our existence. In fact, this life is temporary, right? For the Christian, there awaits us eternal life and eternal joy and blessings in the presence of Christ. And that's what we keep our minds focused on. So our relationship with God is far more important than what and if we eat tomorrow. Our concentration should be on knowing and loving God, as he says later on, and fulfilling his kingdom purposes while we're on this earth. Now, Jesus knows that preoccupation with this temporal world negatively affects our our emotional state. He's probably seen that in his own disciples. As a matter of fact, you can see it in the Gospels. He's talking to the woman at the well, and what are they worried about? The next meal. What are we going to eat? Our concentration, he says, is should be on other things. If you're consumed with worry, it's a sure sign that you've taken your eyes off the Lord. Uh, what you need to do is spend more time with the Lord in prayer, building your relationship with God, more time learning about Him through the study of His Word, because the better you know God, the greater your trust in Him will be and the less you will worry about things that have no eternal consequence. Now look at verse 26. Here's another reason we shouldn't worry. He says, God always cares for his beloved children. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Then you go on to verse 28. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? This is what we call a logical argument from the lesser to the greater. God takes care of the birds. That's the lesser. And we know that he does, doesn't he? He gives them the instinct to gather food and to nest. Notice they work for their food, but they don't worry about getting any food. They just go out and work, right? And it's there for them. And they gather that, and he provides what they need as they go out to find that food. Well, if God takes care of the birds, won't he take care of you? After all, God's children, who each possess an eternal soul, are much more valuable to God than a bird. And think of this, God never sent his son to redeem birds. He sent his son to redeem fallen human beings. That's how much he cares for us. Look at the beautiful flowers in the field that God makes. Flowers, they don't make their own apparel, do they? Yet the flowers are more beautifully clothed than Solomon was, and he was the richest man in the world in his day, and the splendor of his kingdom was legendary even in his own time. Jesus says, look, if, if God puts such a beautiful dressing on the grass of the field, which is only here today, and then is fuel for the bread of and tomorrow, will he not see to it that his redeemed children are clothed? Of course he's going to do that, because he loves us. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And probably the most important thing that the Lord says here 
is in verse 30. He says, worry shows a lack of faith in the Lord. Worry shows a lack of faith in God. Oh, you a little faith. Why are you worrying so much about these things? If you wonder whether or not God is going to take care of you, and you doubt whether he can do that, then you don't know God very well. You don't understand his nature. I'm not saying you're not saved. You may very well be redeemed. You just don't know what Scripture says about the nature of God. What's the remedy for that? Study Scripture. Immerse yourself in the Word of God, which is his gift to us, and get to know him and his attributes and how much he loves us. You need to correct that deficiency if you don't understand the nature of God by studying his word. Immerse yourself in that. I think many Christians have a kind of, um, well, a kind of deistic view of God, I would say. Deism, uh, the extreme form of it is the belief that though God exists, he's uninterested in the details of our lives. Um, some deists, the more extreme form of these, a couple hundred years ago, believed that God created the universe and then he left it alone to run by itself with no involvement or interest from him. You know, it's kind of like winding up a clock. And Well, you probably, some of you don't know about winding clocks. Everything's digital now. But in the old days, we had alarm clocks that you wound up. <laughs> and like he just wound up the universe and walked away from it. But that's not the God of Scripture. The Bible says that God cares about you and the details of your life. That's why the Apostle Peter urges us to cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. I, Jesus puts it another way in the Gospels. He says he knows every hair in your head, every sparrow in the sky. He knows who they are. He's not only capable of knowing the details of our life, he is interested in the details of our life. So if we worry about everything in life, Jesus says our faith is too small. It needs to be built. You need to build it up by getting to know God better, studying his word. Then you'll see how much God cares for you. The more you pray, the more you see God answer prayer, and the more you trust in him and you develop, you develop an understanding of his power and his desire to meet your needs. I have, I have to say I'm surprised at how much fear I've heard Christians express over the COVID pandemic and the remote possibility that we might contract a life-threatening disease. Folks, there's a lot of things in this life that can kill us, right? I mean, we probably have a higher chance of getting in an automobile accident that might be fatal going home from church today than we do getting this disease that might kill us. We might get it, but chances of dying from it are pretty slim unless you have some sort of uh, serious physical problem. But man, I mean, we've, we've sure let the news media scare us. Now, I understand when lost people are scared like that, but Christians shouldn't be that way. God is in control of my life. He has my days numbered. We need to trust him. We don't want to take unnecessary risks and test God, but on the other hand, we need to trust him and not worry about things so much. Maybe, maybe many Christians in America, I'm speaking of, are just ignorant of what the Bible teaches regarding this life and God's attributes and his wise providential care over our lives. Maybe this is a test that God has allowed us to go through to help us examine our trust in him. How much do we trust him? And we need to heed what the Lord says here. Worry is a waste of time and energy, Jesus says, verse 27. He says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Some of your translations may say a single cubit to his life or lifespan. The, tra the, pr the phrase could be translated a couple of different ways. It could be understood as adding to your stature, your height or adding to the length of your life. More likely, it's the second that he's getting at here. And this really is the central issue. If we worry about things all the time, we're just wasting time and energy. We can't add any length to our lives by worrying about things. We can't produce job security by worry. We can't put food on the table by worry. 
We can't solve any of the problems of our life by worrying about them. In fact, worrying too much can cause us more problems. Henry Mayo said, I never met a man who worked himself to death, but I sure met a lot who worried themselves to death. And Jesus, in, a, in kind of a mild re, reproof or rebuke to his disciples, says, look, worry is something the godless pagans do. Don't you do that. Look at verse 31. He says, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? In verse 32, the Gentiles, they seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Don't be like them. The Gentiles, and he's referring to, were pagans who worshipped false gods. They believed to be capricious, even cruel. Uh, if you've read any Greek mythology, you know about this. And so the Gentiles believed in these kinds of gods, and they'd perform all kinds of rituals to appease them. Yet Paul told the pagan Lystrans that the true God even bestows blessings on those who don't know him. Acts 14, verse 17, he says, God did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You ever think about the fact that food tastes good? doesn't taste like cardboard? It could be just as nutritious, right? But God made it so it has a flavor and, made you have, and gave you the ability to taste it. That's a blessing from God that's bestowed not just upon believers, but upon every human being. God is a good God. In our day, an evolutionary mindset has produced a self-centered, materialistic, pessimistic society that's void of peace. I mean, after all, if people believe there's no God, or if they believe that God is really uninterested in this world and in their lives, it's only logical for them to worry about a lot of things, especially those things beyond human control. So a faulty view of God and his word produces a lot of worry about the challenges of life. And so there is a remedy for that. Know God better, know what he says. Understand his word. Seek to know what he says in his word. Jesus says that God not only exists, he is a loving and compassionate father who provides for his own redeemed children. In Christ, the son of God is your savior and he's your Lord. And then God the father promises to take care of you because of that. So what is the remedy for worry? He says in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added to you. What does he mean by that? First of all, make knowing God the priority of your life. Do you know Christ is your savior? If you don't have that taken care of, that's where you need to start. You need to belong to God's family. And you do that by placing your whole trust and faith in Jesus Christ and the work he did on the cross to pay for our sins. Know God. That's the priority of your life. Not work, not earn, no. Know him by faith in Christ. Be more concerned with spiritual issues instead of spending all of your time seeking money and things and then worry about whether you're going to have enough. Somebody asked a very, very wealthy man one time, it was an interview on television many decades ago. This man was what we would call uh, extremely rich. And he said, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little more. Now, he wasn't saying that's how he thought. He was saying, don't seek it. It's never enough. Seek God's kingdom first. That means we should be concerned that we're a part of God's kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ. Are you redeemed? Do you know Christ is your Savior? That's the first priority right there. And then we ought to be, if we know Christ is our Savior, we ought to be working to help increase the kingdom by sharing the gospel with the lost folks around us. This is what the church is all about. We're to go to the lost who are consumed by the worries of this world, and boy, they're consumed right now, aren't they? And we have the remedy. 
and introduce them to the love of the Lord Jesus, who's the only one who can bring them real peace that they real des they desperately need right now. So a Christian should be more concerned with the eternal business of the kingdom of God and less concerned with the temporal business and concerns of this world. And then he says, seek the righteousness of God. It's really two ways of saying the same thing. Seek the kingdom of God, seek the righteousness of God. Seek after the righteousness which, of God which comes only through faith in Christ. Then once you're justified by faith in Christ, which Brian talked about last week, live according to the principles of God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't let the material things of this world consume your life and your thoughts and your time. Be consumed with God and his will and his righteousness and his people. Let God deal with those things that you have no control over. There's a lot of things in life we have no control over, right? Jesus says, let God worry about those things. Now, Jesus doesn't promise that our lives on this earth are going to be free from hardship and trouble. I don't find that anywhere in Scripture. That's not a New Testament concept. In fact, he frequently taught his disciples to expect tribulation in this world. John 16, 33, in his upper room discourse to his disciples, he said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. If you're in me and you know me by faith, you can have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Not you might, but you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, did Jesus suffer tribulation? He sure did. He was nailed to a cross for our sins. But he overcame, didn't he? And because he overcame, we overcome. Because he was victorious over sin and death, we, by faith in him, are victorious over sin and death. The temporary troubles of this world are small in comparison to the eternal blessings we have in Christ. So part of this is having the right perspective, a, a biblical perspective of life, right? Sure, we could, we could catch a disease, we could contract cancer, uh, we could get in an accident, have a heart attack. Uh, there's so many things that can take us out of this life. But so what? I know where I'm going. I once told a doctor of mine this. She wanted me to take some uh, certain medication. What it was is not important. And I had done some study on it, and I shied away from it. I said, I'm, uh, no, thank you. And Because it had too many serious side effects. And so I, I, I basically told her, I'll take my chances. And she said, but no, but you could have a... I said, how much more chance do you think of dying that I have if I don't take this medication? She said something like 17% or something. like. I said, 17% of what? You know, I mean, you got to have a couple other numbers here to make a comparison, right? You know, what does that mean? I'm not a statistician, but I know you need a few more comparison points than that. <laughs> but anyway, I said, I said, doctor, I'm not afraid of dying. And she looked at me like, and uh, she was from another culture. I'm sure she was from another religion. And I said, I know Jesus is my Savior. I know where I'm going. When I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm going from the trouble of this life to the blessings of heaven. The passage through might not be so pleasant, but that's okay. I'm still, I still know what the ultimate destination is. Amen? We know where we're going. We know what's going to happen. And right now, we can enjoy our eternal life in Christ. That's what Christ is getting at here. Paul says, look, in comparison to Romans 8, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now that's the right perspective. He told the Corinthians, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I'm thinking to myself, wow. I mean, have you seen the list of Paul's uh, uh, Sufferings in 2 Corinthians, beaten, shipwrecked, you name it, he went through it. Stoned and left for dead. And he says, ah, light and momentary affliction. <laughs> you know, it's obviously he's 
giving us a comparison. So the next time worry starts to invade your mind, do what the Apostle Paul says. Write this verse down. I want, this is your assignment. I want you to memorize this text. And I mean you memorize it backwards, forwards, upside down. Memorize this text. The next time you wake up at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning worrying about something you have no control over, you start reciting this text. And you recite it to yourself and you pray that text until God gives you the peace that he promises. Now, notice what it says. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, thanking God for all the blessings of your life, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Does he promise I'll take the trouble away from you? No. He doesn't promise God's going to do that. He says God will give you peace. You may have to go through the trouble, but you'll have the peace of God as you go through it. I'm telling you folks, this works. Uh, I am the kind of warrior that wakes up in the middle of the night when everybody else is sleeping or my wife is sawing logs over there and I'm just, you know, and, and I'm you know, worried about something I have no control over and I start praying through this text. And every time I do, God just gives me peace. I realize, man, I shouldn't be worrying about this stuff. God is in control. What's the worst that can happen to me? I'm not going to lose my salvation. I'm still going to heaven. We've got to have some perspective in life. Amen? Stop worrying about everything. Yes. Let's stop listening to the news media all the time. You know what their goal is? Not to tell us the truth, it's to get us to click. To click on their channel, to listen to them so that they can get us to do it again and so they can collect advertising dollars and they'll tell us the worst news they can find or they'll take good news and turn it bad. It's amazing how they'll do that. Let's stop listening to them and listen more to the Lord. Trust in Him. Yeah, it's a troubling time in our country. But we, have, as Christians, we have the peace of God.